Hello, I'm Professor McCoy, and today I want to talk about the Imago Dei uh, and what a few philosophers think that that could possibly mean. Uh, and to do that, I want to look at uh, the view of Duns Scotus, who I've been talking about in some other videos, uh, and J.R.R. Tolkien. This may seem like an odd pair to bring together, uh, especially in terms of something uh, of a relatively obscure topic like the Imago Dei, uh, but I will argue that the two of them have a fairly similar view of what it means to be in the image and likeness of God. So I'll begin with a sort of explanation that we, uh, that, uh, or a sort of observation that Scotus makes uh, about the, uh, the creation narrative in Genesis. So when we start reading Genesis, um, by the time we get to, uh, uh, to the narrative telling us that uh, God made man, uh, let us make man in our own image. He asks, what is it that we know of God at this point? What has the narrative told us about God? Well, simply, so far, that God is creator. God is the source of being, that which causes and that which creates ex nihilo, from nothing. Uh, and so, from this, and of course from other philosophical arguments, um, Scotus takes this to indicate that creation has to be something to do with what makes us human and what, what makes us in the image and likeness of God. So now looking to uh, Tolkien, because this is where it, be it begins to, uh, to look quite similar. Um, Tolkien, uh, in his essay on fairy stories, um, talks a significant about a significant amount about uh, our role, our human beings' role, as what he calls sub-creators. Uh, and this is what he takes narrative to be, right? So Tolkien takes uh, the creation of narrative and the writing of stories, the telling of stories, uh, as a kind of creation analogous to the kind of creation that God does, creating the, the real world. Um, so what we see in Tolkien here is the idea that human beings have this innate creative capacity, this ability to create worlds of our own that have a kind of uh, that have a kind of coherence to them, even a kind of uh, of uh, less than fully real reality, if you want to think of it that way, uh, a kind of reflection of reality reflected through our own creativity, our own capacity to create in the same manner that God does, from nothing, right? We don't create our, uh, our narrative worlds from, uh, or at least not entirely from our imaginations, we do it from our, uh, from our, well, from our Imago Dei, from the image of God, uh, Tolkien will suggest, right? or innate capacity for this creativity, this, this ability to create worlds, to sub-create worlds, as he would say, um, to sub-create narratives, thought, come up with originality that isn't just sort of a remixing of the things that we perceive, uh, the things that we know about from God's creation. Right? This is what it is to be in the image and likeness of God. This is what it is to bear God's image. Okay, so... For Tolkien, this does focus because, of course, he was uh, uh, he was a uh, writer. He was primarily concerned with literature, uh, and so he focuses on our capacity to create stories, to create narratives. Scotus, of course, will take the same idea, the same, or at least a very similar idea, the idea of the imago dei being our creativity, our ability to create, and he will take it a bit further. Because Scotus will ask, "What is it that we human beings create?" What is it that we do which has no antecedent to it, well, no antecedent cause uh, that we do not out of the materials that we are given, but completely out of ourselves? And if you've seen any of my previous videos, especially when I tie in uh, Scotus and Anselm closely together, you may come to the conclusion that Scotus does, which is that we are creators in our acts of free choice. Now, what does that mean? It's a strange thing to say, that we create our choices from nothing. But if we think back to Anselm's definition of, sponta of spontaneity or spontaneous action, right? an action is spontaneous uh, if it is caused entirely from what is within the agent. 
It is not caused from something outside. It is not forced in any way. It comes completely from the agent cause, right? from the free individual who chooses, who acts. So I want to emphasize the importance of this uh, because it can often be overlooked. And Scotus, in fact, goes, um, in a sense, all the way back to, uh, to Aristotle. Uh, for some of the uh, for some of the basis uh, for this view, um, because Scotus begins to ask, okay, well, what what is it to initiate a causal sequence? And we ask, and he asks, is God the only initiator of novel causal sequences? And he comes to the conclusion that of course not. From our immediate experience, we we observe ourselves and we know that we cause things that are not determined by antecedent factors. One way that Scotus explains this is that we are sources of contingency. Right? And so we are analogous to God in a sense. We, are, we have the same image or likeness of God in our... Um, he compares it to aseity, the, uh, that, that God stands apart from things, that God is the ultimate origin of causal series. Well, Scotus will point out that, well, so are we. Right? To use the, uh, the Aristotelian terms, we are, in that sense, unmoved movers. We begin causal sequences that are not caused by something beyond ourselves. Right? Now, I don't want to get the, I don't want to take this too far. Uh, I, don't wanna, I don't want us to start thinking that, that we, finite creatures, are necessary beings, are that than which nothing greater can be thought, can, are being itself unconditioned, etc. Right? No, he doesn't want to say that. Right. Scotus, of course, uh, as with uh, almost every other philosopher, acknowledges that we are finite, we are created, we are caused. And we get our capacity to create from, an out from something outside of ourselves. So our causal powers are derivative. Right? Scotus wouldn't want to deny that. Right? He, would, he does claim, of course, that we are... We are um, our acts of creation ex nihilo are still... Uh, we, we still gain this capacity from somewhere, right? So there is an antecedent cause in a sense, right? But there's only an antecedent cause of the causer, of the first cause of this causal sequence. There is a break, in other words, in this causal sequence. Right? God creates me, for instance, and I create a, a video recording. Right? I create this lecture. I create this thought that I'm conveying to you now. However... Scotus makes the key point that what I am doing, right, my thoughts, my words, my actions, my recording in this case, right, that this is not a direct action of God in the same sense that, uh, that uh, something natural might be, right? So, um, so the, uh, um, in the same sense that uh, maybe the light coming in from the window, right? There's a window over to my left. There's light coming in. Light is filtering through from the sunlight, right? All of that is happening naturally, necessarily. So we can attribute all of that directly to God. There's no break in the causal series from God's creation of the sun, right? mediated as that might be, um, to light coming in through my window. There was no, the sun didn't have to act in this full, robust sense that I do in order to think and to speak and to act. Right? So I think this is where, once again, we tie, we tie this back to Tolkien's description of sub-creation. And I think this is a perfect distinction to make, because uh, thinking of our acts of creation as sub-creation, right? our free acts as sub-creation, um, this kind of heads off the uh, the mistaken idea that we are uh, we are causes of ourselves, or that we are completely asse, right? That we are independent. Right? Of course, we are still dependent on God. We are still created beings. We are still finite, and all of this. But we're granted this capacity to create from ourselves and from nothing beyond ourselves. I do think we should, though, take uh, take both of these and put them together, right? And consider any of our actions, right? any of our free actions, anything that we 
uh, we choose to do in the full, robust, voluntary sense. And all of these things taken on this view are acts of, <clears throat> uh, in a very important sense, creation ex nihilo. Right? Our free actions are not caused by antecedent, uh, antecedent factors. They come entirely from us. We make them. They are the beginnings of new causal series. And causal series that would not occur if we had not made the choice, right? Uh, I could have recorded a different video today. Um, I could have not, th not thought to make this connection, right? I could have not chosen to use this connection in particular. I could have instead compared um, Tolkien to another philosopher. I might have compared him to Anselm. I might have used an example from Thomas Aquinas, right? Um, but I didn't, right? I chose to compile my thoughts and explain them in this particular way. And so the causal series that results from this, right? The thoughts in my head becoming words that, it, that come from my mouth, that get recorded by the camera, that get uploaded and then are impressed upon your mind. And that inspires thoughts in you that you can then use to begin your own novel causal series. You can then compile these thoughts that I'm giving, and they are not, uh, what you create from that is not caused by me, except in a very distant sense that I have sort of given you the material with which to start your own creation, to act in the way that you will act. Right. So this is, I think, uh, a, a perfectly viable candidate for the Imago Dei. Now, there are other uh, there are other candidates, right? Other philosophers have, po have proposed different things, uh, having to do with rationality, having to do with uh, self-reflection, the usual candidates for consciousness, right? Um, philosophers have also proposed things like our capacity for uh, for love, right? Our capacity for charity, caritas, right? Um, or the, the, and the broadly speaking, the theological virtues. Um, but I think this captures what is, first of all, unique about God that we also have a sort of reflection of, that seems to be a unique reflection among creation. And it also fits in well with the narrative, and I think that is, a, that is uh, if nothing else, certainly something that Tolkien especially would appreciate uh, as, uh, as a scholar of literature, would really... Um, uh, I think this will this fits together between the the sort of scholastic thought of Duns Scotus, the late scholastic thought of Duns Scotus, um, with the uh, the sort of uh, maybe maybe we can say neo scholastic uh, thought of J.R.R. Tolkien. It's an oversimplification of just about everything to characterize his views in that way, but um, but this idea of the imago dei being uh, being our human capacity for creation, or perhaps sub-creation, uh, is certainly a viable candidate. Uh, and it is, uh, if nothing else, I think uh, it's hard to argue that this is not at least a part of uh, our the image and likeness of God that we human beings bear. So that's all I have for today. Uh, so I hope this was, uh, this was edifying and this uh, inspires some novel thoughts. Uh, and you, the audience. So with that, I will see you next time. Bye.